time uh, standing by for uh, reacquisition uh, with Columbia through Aurora Valley. All right, that's the reacquisition. That's the second tracking station in Australia that we're looking Receiving a roll. Hello, Columbia now. talking to you through Aurora. We have you for uh, two minutes and 45 seconds, and we do have some flight notes when you're ready. Brandon's fine in mission control. Passing his message to John Young and Bob Griffin. We're waiting now for them to acknowledge. On your map, you can see where the spacecraft is flying over Australia in the lower left-hand corner of the picture. This is the big map in mission control right now. Computer driven. Columbia, Houston, talking to you through Aurora. We have you for two and a half minutes. Set your watch. They have two and a half minutes of station contact. Six, five, four. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. shuttle and the shuttle has cleared the tower trailing streaks of flame and clouds of gray smoke Columbia cleared its 347 foot tower in five seconds it was traveling at the speed of sound in less than 30 seconds they reached an altitude of almost eight miles in one minute it was out of sight 20 miles high in two minutes Senator Schmidt, when we talk about the accomplishments of technology, as we said before, sometimes we tend uh, perhaps to overestimate them and talk about them too much, but on a day like today, it's pretty hard when you look over those figures of lifting that much, that far, that fast, not to absolutely marvel at the accomplishment of so many intelligent people. And after the, uh, of course, the creation of this country under a very almost unique set of democratic circumstances, uh, if you look back in our history, so many of our major milestones represent a major technological advance for this country and then subsequently the world. I, I, I think it would not be presumptuous to say this is another one such milestone. The ground shook all around the Space Center. One, one thing that I noticed, uh, Dan, was that there seemed to be uh, uh, a, an, an emphasis of the low frequency sound that was shaking, the, the more seismic sound, if you will. And if I recall the Saturn V correctly, the one we rode to the moon, there was a, in addition to that, there was a crackling. You remember that crackling That's that used to get almost like it was a continuous lightning uh, discharge? Uh, here you just had a continuous pulsing sound without the crackling. It, uh, it, it was exciting, obviously. Uh, everybody, you, I was, every once in a while, turn around and watch the people in the studio here. And it grins from ear to ear, and I think a few tears if I didn't uh, look uh, improperly. Well, I would think uh, that even for those people, uh, and I'd have to say candidly, including myself, who have some reservations about the space program and have had uh, over the years and say, well, you know, is it cost effective, is it worth the money, and that kind of thing, would have to be tremendously excited and tremendously proud on a day like today. Uh, if you're not going to get excited about this, you're not very likely to get excited about well, anything. we're moving into a new ocean, Dan, and uh, we really have no choice. As long as the uh, competition, so to speak, is going to move there, and as long as human aspirations are there, we must move with them. And there is the, uh, the argument, I know you're one who subscribes to it, that the historical center of gravity shifted from the Atlantic to the Pacific with the discovery of the New World, the Western Hemisphere. And now the historical center of gravity is shifting from Earth somewhere out there. That it's a matter of some civic pride in, in the city where mission control is located that the first word man spoke on the moon was the word Houston. Mm. <laughs> uh, they like that in Houston, Texas very much. A couple of other little facts that are quite interesting. One is that they measured the heartbeat of the two astronauts as they took off from the pad here at Cape Canaveral this morning. And Crippen, who had not been in space before, registered a heartbeat of 130 beats per minute on the, as they were taking off. But Young, who has been in space uh, before, his heartbeat was ranging from 85 to 90. I think we know which one was more excited right. than the other, uh, just from that alone. But they're, they're up there, and things are going well. And uh, Joe Kerwin, from your experience in space, you believe that we may not have been able to hear from them because they might have been moving from one position to another? Possibly. They were due to egress to seats at that time. They're not going to dock their suits until a little later on, but they, they may well have been unplugged 
temporarily from the uh, egress from the seats. They were going to get out of their seats and move around. They were bit. right. They were ready to go to the aft station and start throwing switches back there to get ready for the payload bay door. Let's talk about Let's what talk kind of, about that. Yeah, you know, configuration. First of all, what what kind of shape are they in? Is they flying? Are they, are they still upside down at this point? They just started a maneuver uh, to make sure that they are that they become upside down and stay upside down. They're pointing the payload bay toward the earth. Right. And the reason they're doing this is that they want a nice even temperature on those payload bay doors. They don't want them to get too hot or too cold. All right, now let's talk about that. This is uh, the heart, really, of the Columbia Space Shuttle. This is what it's all about. We're talking about this, they call it a payload bay. It's a cargo area is what it is, in effect. And it's 60 feet by 17 feet by 13 feet, if I get all of my figures correct. Right. Yeah, uh, we, we, we generally average that out and say 15 feet in diameter because it'll take that big of a round payload. All right, well, we'll have a chance to talk about that some yeah. more. What we want to do now is Robert Frizzell is there, I believe, with Hugh Harris, who was the, the voice you heard during the launch this morning. Is that right, Bob? That's right. This is the man who we heard counting down before the launching, who, who we heard talking to us in those wonderful, reassuring tones all morning, telling us everything was okay. And I think millions of Americans want to say that you did a, did a really fine job, uh, Mr. Harris. Oh, thank you very much. I'm really glad I didn't have to go on because you get all choked up when you see that uh, shuttle lifting off for the first time with people on board. What was it like in the uh, fire control room there just before uh, liftoff and right afterwards? Well, there was a, a lot of confidence today that you could, you know, feel the, you know, the tension was not quite the same as the other day when we had things going wrong, as you might expect. And uh, there were several places where we got little things that happened and happened correctly, where, you know, there was sort of a collective sigh of relief or a little cheer. And then when it went up, there was just a tremendous cheer. Everybody was, you know, just, just this tremendous release of energy. Has there been many launches that went as smoothly, smoothly as the one did today? Well, yes, there's, there's a lot of launches that go pretty smoothly here. Uh, but, you know, this is the first time for the shuttle. It's something that's very, very important for the nation. And I think that there was a lot of extra pressure to make sure that it went and it went right. What are we going to hear at the news conference that's starting here uh, with Mr. Page in a few minutes? Well, I think he's going to tell you that he has a tremendous launch team and that they did a job superbly as, uh, as they did indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Ash. We, we appreciate you coming by, and oh, it was very nice to hear you counting down and see the thing fire. Thank you. Okay, now back to you fellows in the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob Azell and Hugh Harris, the man behind the voice. And he touched on the thing that struck me. You, you tend to focus a lot on the hardware and the electronics and the computers and so on, but once you lift off, you see all that power and realize that there are two men sitting on top of it all going off into space. That's some thought to have as you're watching it all go. We'll be back uh, continuing our coverage of the successful launch now of the Columbia Space Shuttle headed for the United States at a pretty high altitude right after this. We're going to take you on an impossible business trip. <laughs> We're supposed to see that picture in about two and a half or three minutes. Transmission. They open this one up, and then they close it back down, and then they latch it up again to make sure everything works, and then they open the two of them, right? That's Bill? right, and they're 10 minutes ahead of schedule if that right door is, is open. Now, they'll close it very, very slowly, and as the latches approach the rollers, they will observe exactly how they go in and determine whether they can safely relatch the door. The astronauts now out of their seats and standing at an area overlooking this big cargo area. Don Young running the television camera, Bob Crippen running the remote, uh, remote control system that uh, controls the doors and the latches. One of the things to keep in mind when you see those doors, which we expect to see here on our TV screens before very long, is that they weigh 3,000 pounds. Uh, and they will be moving very, very slowly when, they're, when you see them. And, but as we pointed out before, if those doors can't be opened, the spacecraft will heat up and they'll have to come back down. They don't have enough cooling uh, equipment aboard the spacecraft now to keep it cool without those doors open, uh, allowing the heat to escape from the very strong electrical systems that are aboard Columbia. And have I got that right, Joe Kerwin? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and we're waiting now for the picture, which uh, we have a, a one hour and 35 minutes uh, of elapsed time since they left here at Cape Canaveral. And at one hour and 36 minutes, we're supposed to see this picture. And they've gone around the world the other way. Uh, 
and they're coming back up over the west coast of the United States. So they're moving right along at about uh, 17,000 miles an hour at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me think. Around 17,600, I guess, yeah. 